Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff, part of the awesome stuff. This is the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Jamila talking with us today. Hello, Jamila. Hey, Frank. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for agreeing to talk about your very awesome article here. Very nice, we'll get, which we'll get to very soon. Uh, and Jamila, where are you located at? Um, I'm located in Urbana-Champaign at the University of Illinois. Okay. Um, I'm a PhD student in electrical and computer engineering. Awesome. Uh, and when, is you, when do you plan to graduate? This spring, hopefully. Oh, um, very good. And I'll be moving on to Michigan as a postdoc. All right. Well, I'll do the early. Well, congratulations, Dr. Talkies. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Awesome. Very good. Uh, Urbana. Uh, and it is February 22nd of 2024 as we record this. And does Urbana have snow on the ground? Are you making snow um, outside? <laughs> not quite. It has a little bit of uh, snow remnants from five days ago. So okay. I don't know if that counts. No, uh, more so than Phoenix. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm in Phoenix and we definitely don't have any snow. In fact, we're starting to warm up into our, our definite spring here as we warm up. So very cool. Uh, and Jamila, what do you like to do for research? So my research looks at the statistical properties of exoplanet data processing architectures. Cool. And um, I design tractable joint modeling approaches and robust data-driven signal models to minimize the effect of systematics or instrument noise in data and reveal astrophysical or exoplanet signals in the data. Very cool. Um, and my thesis research is mostly focused on transit photometry. However, for the past year, I've been working on future direct imaging mission concepts. Ooh, yes, yes. Very cool, very cool. And that is gonna bring us to this very awesome AJ article. It is open access. It's the open access era. People go grab a copy for free. Robust detrending of spatially correlated systematics and Kepler light curves using low rank methods. And Jamila, take us away. Yeah, so um, this method looks at improving the inference of systematics in Kepler data. Um, and in particular, the kind of typical noise models that are used for systematics. So Frank, would you quickly show that image of the Kepler sensor? I will. Let me get this up. So we're going to show a little sensor, a little extra bonus here. And there we go. So I want to first describe a little bit of the context and explain mm -hmm. the origin of some of the instrument noise in photometry. Um, so here is a picture of the Kepler sensor. Uh, consists of, uh, I don't want to say the wrong number, but I think it's 42 CCDs aligned. Okay. Um, and on each CCD, you see many stars um, as little specks of unresolved brightness. Mm -hmm. So a sensor like Kess, uh, sorry, TESS or Kepler mm -hmm. um, observes many stars contemporaneously and collects unresolved brightness measurements of these targets over time. Um, the brightness is uh, subject to the instrument response. So the brightness is spread over several pixels, which are summed together to form light curve data. So the problem is that um, this cannot be performed with complete accuracy because the telescope may have subtle instrument errors, subtle pointing shifts, um, or differing uh, response pixel response, which right. cause the expected instrument response to vary over time and position on the sensor. Okay. And if unaccounted for, it leads to these kind of really quite significant errors in the observed data. Now, the, mm -hmm. the reason why I wanted to show this sensor is because um, you can also see that um, these light curves have some kind of spatial proximity to each other, as in the light okay. curves of the different targets on the sensor. Mm -hmm. So it's expected that there may be some kind of correlation between the noise terms if they're originating due to environmental or instrument effects. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that says everything that I wanted to say about that image, and we can go back to the paper now, and okay. I'll explain where my work fits in. Let's do that, and show. And there we go. So this work um, I worked on with my two advisors, 
Professor Athol Kemble, um, who's an astronomy professor here at UIUC, and Professor Farzad Kamalabadi, who's a double E or ECE professor um, here at UIUC. Nice blend. Um, yeah, it's nice. They get the best of both worlds, kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's great. Um, so uh, in a previous work, I looked at um, a joint detection strategy for mm -hmm. um, transit light curves when there are these unknown uh, and dominating systematics in the data. However, um, in a work like that, you need a model for these systematics. Okay. Um, and so I wanted to focus here in this work on what that model is and how it's inferred from the data. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah. first thing to mention is that it may seem like inferring this instrument noise or systematics is just another data processing step, but it's actually a really significant and important part of detecting um, astrophysical signals in the data because um, in order to reach the sensitivity needed to see those transit dips in brightness, mm -hmm. uh, you really need to mitigate the these systematics present. Cool. And okay. so in this paragraph here, I describe the kind of expected sensitivities of different telescopes, um, where it starts if an exoplanet transit induces a fractional flux density of delta F, mm -hmm. um, and what the, they are before and after doing these systematics removal. Okay. Cool. So some of the difficulty in doing estimating systematics is, as I mentioned before, um, the instrument response will vary over a range of time scales and spatial mm. scales. So um, there may be varying pixel response as in the um, brightness um, res response. So if there is a slight sub pixel shift of the target on the sensor, yes. um, and this is not accounted for in your uh, aperture photometry model, um, your brightness will estimate will be off. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and there are, uh, are so there's different uh, pixel sensitivity, and even within a pixel, there are different sensitivities yes. uh, of where the target is on that pixel. And um, yep, if you could scroll to the next page. Sure. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I talk first about some of the existing models that are out there okay. and they kind of, there's a lot of overlap between them. It's really difficult to categorize them exactly, but there are some kind of broad themes um, and it's important to understand uh, where this work fits in to those broad themes. Yes. Um, so broadly, there's a class of, or some of the original um, methods to estimate systematics are are referred to as external parameter decorrelation methods. Okay. So these methods um, take some other time series observed, um, some measured uh, feature or physical characteristic of the instrument, okay. and they use that time series um, as a proxy for what they expect the systematic error to be. So a light curve is, um, in order to estimate the systematics, regressed to whatever this engineering time series, engineering data time series is, right. um, in order to try to estimate the systematics. Gotcha. I'm with you. Um, so yeah, so this was used um, successfully for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, related to that are, well, sorry, not related to that exactly, but then the people started to look into, instead of using the engineering data, what if we could also use the pixel data or yeah. light curve data itself to detrend or decorrelate nice. um, the observations? Um, and the idea there is that they contain more information about whatever the systematic error is than necessarily the engineering variables do. Okay. Um, and this was especially needed for the K2, uh, which is where the Kepler reaction wheel failed, and then the pointing yes. became really terrible yes. with the telescope. Um, so it inspired this whole host of methods to try to correct huh. photometry just using 
the pixel time series brightness measurements mm -hmm. uh, correlated against observations. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of categorize, categorize those methods against a different kind of set of methods called co-trending methods, okay. um, where um, the, the things used, the regressors, are light curves themselves. Um, as I say, it's difficult to kind of exactly categorize these methods because pixel data itself yes. can be considered a form of light curve. Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, so um, if you would just scroll to the top of the page. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the first of these kind of co-trending basis methods was the trend filtering algorithm, mm -hmm. which used a set of light curves over across the sensor and fitted them to the observed light curve you're trying to trend okay. um, in order to estimate the systematic noise. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And then later on, there came various refinements to this method. And I think the most kind of successful or um, one of the ones which inspired my method or is my method is somewhat based on is the Kepler PDC map algorithm. So that stands mm -hmm. for pre-data conditioning maximum a posteriori. Nice, that's a mouthful. And, yeah, a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> and this method kind of has a multi-stage inference process. Okay. And I'm not going to fully do it justice because there's even more steps than just uh, the kind of high-level ones I'm going to describe. But the main techniques this method uses is it, um, instead of directly using light curves as a set of regressors, um, performs a singular value decomposition. Okay. Mm -hmm. to obtain a, a representative set of uh, basis light curves, we'll call yes. them, or basis vectors, mm -hmm. which represent the, the bulk of noise, uh, of the systematic noise in the overall collection of light curves in the sensor. And then based on physical information or physical uh, inferences, um, they form a Bayesian prior on what they expect the weightings or the amplitude of these noise effects to be in various mm -hmm. light curves. And this Bayesian prior that they form is based uh, pretty much on two main physical characteristics. The first is that the systematic noise terms or their amplitude exhibit um, correlations or dependency on the magnitude of the target. Okay. Which is expected because um, brighter targets tend to undergo similar saturation effects. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the second um, uh, physical characteristic, which they in incorporate into their Bayesian prior, um, is the position of the target on the sensor. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they have this Bayesian prior and they have this set of basis uh, terms representing noise effects, and then they fit them to a light curve and remove them. Okay, gotcha. So where my work fits in, I would say, is most closely to the PDC map algorithm, because in this work, um, I want to incorporate a physical constraint in the estimation of systematics to improve the robustness um, to these unknown astrophysical signals, which may be present in light curves. But I want to do it in an automated or foundational way. Nice. Um, instead of performing this multi-stage fitting, I want to actually construct a new model instead of using an SVD, a new model which can automatically infer when there are correlations um, spatially on the sensor between light curves. Cool, cool. And I, sh I should clarify it by spatial, I mean, the proximity of targets on the sensor to each other, their physical position on the CCD. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Not not spatially close as yeah, in. Yeah, no, no, they'll be all over the place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the CCD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which okay. I guess does correspond to spatial closeness in space as well, but uh, anyhow. Angular anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, cool. um, yeah, this is a description of some of the other methods, some other successful ones, which also use... Um, models which aren't based on the SVD or they come up with their own formulations. Right. Um, but yeah, we can scroll down and get to the, mm. well, so um, 
the kind of key idea behind all systematics inference methods, which may not be obvious, so I should state it, is that um, because the instrument effects um, are correlated, the systematics are expected to be correlated, whereas the astrophysical signals seen between light curves are not expected to be correlated, um, at least not in any meaningful statistical sense. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So that that really justifies the use of a lot of the methods like SVD and PCA. Um, uh -huh. I'll I'll get into it. I'll get into that now. So, okay. um, so I think the first best place to start is on the light curve decomposition. Um, maybe if we go to the next page. Okay, just looking. Yep, and you can get this. Here we go. Get it at the oh, yeah. repo if you want to get it. Let's give a shout out to it. <clears throat> it's available. Go get it. Okay. Like yeah. So, um, yeah, my project's on GitHub and so is the data. Good. Good. Awesome. That is great. Okay. Like curve decomp? Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the mathematical model. Um, and I know there will be a lot of symbols, but hopefully it won't be too complicated. I like symbols. <laughs> yeah, it reduces information in a way. It does. Um, okay, so a collection of light curves I denote by Y, Y being the light curve and I being the index of the light curve. Mm -hmm. um, and each light curve is a vector of N measurements or a length N time series. Yes. And um, here in our model, this I, this index, kind of also maps to a position, an X and Y position on the sensor. On the sensor, OK. Mm -hmm. um, in our work and in most of the work, um, which any method which uses SVD or PCA, there's this kind of inherent uh, or sorry, implicit statistical model, which is that each light curve consists of the systematic yes. term L, which we want to estimate, and a noise term N. Here, noise is the astrophysical signal, usually yeah. the thing we're interested in, but okay. <laughs> for the purpose of systematics estimation, we call it noise. Okay, fine. Just It's fine. I'm clear. Okay, good. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Now, it's important to understand that in a typical exoplanet detection pipeline, um, this step is performed prior to exoplanet detection. Mm -hmm. So you don't a priori know if there is a transit signal present in the light curve or stellar variability, the form of it. Um, so it's very difficult to have a clear idea or good model for this statistical noise N. Um, so typically the typical model is a Gaussian noise model. Yes, okay. And, um, Second thing to note to establish is that um, since we said that we expect these, so yeah, so we can write the um, data model in matrix form, and I'm going to use that a lot throughout the paper. So just to just to say that when I I write capital Y, mm -hmm. um, that means that the light curves are um, constructed as columns of a matrix. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Same for the noise and the systematics L. Okay. So the goal is to estimate L given Y. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and a typical a typical model uh, or method for this is a, to use a low rank model. Mm -hmm. um, the reason being, we say that the systematics are correlated among our sample of observations or light curves. Um, so therefore, anything any kind of signal that is correlated is linearly dependent and can be represented by uh, the linear combination, therefore, of a smaller subset of terms or basis vectors. Yes. And to make that really clear, um, in our mathematical model, V represents one of these basis vectors, and there yeah. are K of them, and they represent the noise properties of a collection of um, I light curves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So K should should be much smaller than the collection of I light curves because um, we think there's some kind of degenerate representation of the systematics overall. Okay, good. 
-hmm. And yeah, so in a um, in a particular light curve, the systematics Li equal the linear combination with uh, individualized weightings of these basis vector terms. Mm -hmm. So this, these CIs are, are what I call coefficients or amplitudes, okay. and they represent the weightings of each of the individual noise terms. Nice. Um, so if we go up to the next mm -hmm. or next paragraph. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, th this model is implicit in SVD or PCA or can correspond to it. Yes, um, yes. In the in huh. the case when you're estimating a low rank uh, or a a reduced order model linear model um, under Gaussian a Gaussian noise assumption, so that's why I say that um, in the literature this model is implicitly used by many of these detrending methods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also another reason why uh, SVD is is really a popular method to use. Um, and that is because, um, first of all, it gives the, uh, so, so I should mention also, PCA and SVD are related. Um, you can always obtain the PCA solution from an SVD yes. of a matrix. Mm -hmm. And an SVD exists for every matrix, um, and there are constructive methods to find it, meaning mm -hmm. it's a really nice data processing method, a really powerful data processing method. Um, whereas what I'm going to talk about my method, there's no guarantee that you're going to find the optimal solution, um, in terms of the cost function okay. as there is for SVD. SVD yeah. Okay. So S SVD also says that, um, so sorry, the eckhart young mirsky theorem, which is the reason why SVD is used for PCA, um, says that the optimal rank K uh, matrix that minimizes the least squares residual between your observed light curves and your systematics model yes. is given by rank thresholding yes. the SVD of the matrix Y. Cool. Cool. Um, yep. And we could scroll to the appendix and it says that in more detail, but I, okay, yeah, let's do that. So every matrix Y has an SVD written here. Yep. Mm -hmm. The SVD is a decomposition into a set of auth, uh, unitary left singular vectors, a diagonal matrix of uh, singular values, which represent the strength of that term yes. um, in the overall set of like curves, uh -huh. and a set of right singular vectors. Correct. Um, yes. Cool. Where where the the rank the the number of these vectors corresponds to the size of y mm -hmm. um, and so the eckhart young mirsky theorem says that if you want to find some matrix l which minimizes the distance or the residual between y and l but you want to constrain the rank of l um, to be rank k say then the optimal solution to l is to take the svd of y and select from it the top K singular okay. values and vectors. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm with you, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that really justifies the use of um, mm -hmm. SVD so commonly in the literature. So if we go back up now. Yes, Let me do a little slide, this one won't be as quick. <laughs> uh, here we go. Yeah, there's no um, refer back to section 2.3 uh, yeah, from the I appendix, sure unfortunately. Was, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in my model, I I use a similar similar implicit assumption of a Gaussian noise model. Okay. However, I also add a side constraint based similar to PDC map based on the physical property that I expect systematics, which are proximally close on the sensor to be uh, correlated in form. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I essentially use a Bayesian prior and I show in the appendix that um, in fact, the formulation that I use, although it's in this kind of matrix linear form is equivalent to a probabilistic interpretation um, where of uh, placing a Laplacian or Gaussian prior 
on the difference of um, neighboring systematic terms on the sensor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I come up with this cost formulation that I want to minimize. Yes. Um, so I'll break this down. Um, okay, first of all, um, this notation, I'm not sure how familiar people are with it, but this double bar uh, where I subtract something and I say 2F, that just means um, computing a distance measure over uh, yes. these two terms. So Y minus VC, take the distance measure of that. Yes, uh-huh. I'm good. Yeah, so this FVC is corresponds to the typical SVD model. However, I'm now saying I want to solve for this V, this set of basis vectors and this matrix of coefficients. Yes. But I also want to place an additional constraint on what I think the form of C, the coefficient, should be. Okay. And I want to place this foundationally, so as in I solve for the optimal set of basis vectors and weightings uh, jointly based in, with the inclusion of this prior constraint based on physical properties of the sensor. Yes, cool, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Great, um, so yeah, so this looks complicated. Uh, the constraint, this Bayesian prior is, uh, this GC term, I say that it corresponds to the correlation between um, systematics on the sensor. Uh, it's a proxy for that, and I justify okay. it in the appendix. But the idea is um, that um, uh, it, it uses a typical tool found in image processing called a total variation constraint. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. And and this total variation constraint, um, when you choose this parameter p, which can be between one and two, to be equal to two, okay. is equivalent to maximizing the correlation between neighboring systematic terms on the sensor. If we go to figure one, um, okay. you can visually visualize this. Yeah, that's what it was. Okay, good. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Every, um, so the matrix of coefficient C, you could visualize it as each, for each light curve I, there's a vector of coefficient weightings for the different systematic basis vector terms. Mm -hmm. um, for a particular basis vector term and light curve, this corresponds to one of these individual pixels that I've drawn here. Yes, okay. So for light curves that are proximal, they have this X and Y positioning. Um, and this prior computes the correlation okay. between these coefficient weightings. Yes. And you may say, well, why don't you compute the correlation or place a penalty on the systematics themselves? Well, it turns out that this is a pretty good proxy for placing uh, a constraint on the correlation between the systematic terms or the overall systematic terms, oh. L equals V times C. Okay. okay. Um, based on on the maximum kind of difference that you expect between these two, uh, between placing the constraint on systematics versus on just the weights of the terms yes. uh, is bounded by like the maximum singular value, um, which we don't expect to be that much different because um, yes. the systematic terms we're using are uh, uh, highly representative of the overall system. As in, we expect there to be the terms that we include in our model to be largely representative terms and not uh, particular for a specific light curve. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. cool. Um, okay, cool, so. Um, yeah, so I, I said that I place the constraint on the coefficients and the reason for doing that is a mathematical one. It allows this problem to be solved a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to briefly discuss how I solve this problem, and then we can move on to talk about applying this to the data and some of the results to validate this method. Yes, let's figure out how to solve this. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, if we scroll up to the top of the page, mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry, if we scroll back down to the bottom of the page. Bottom of the page. Ah, here's our algorithm. Mm -hmm. Gradient descent. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so um, so I want to minimize 
the sum of these two terms, but over these two matrices, V and C. Yes. And because I placed my prior constraint just on the C matrix, yes. it means that the first term, the least squares residual, only depends on the basis vectors. Yes. So yeah. I use a technique from uh, Golub and Perea called variable elimination. Okay. Which says that, um, uh, well, basically, because the, the first term is the only one that depends on V, for a given C, I can exactly solve what the optimal V is. Yes. Um, and have a functional description of what that solution is. So I can reinsert that solution for V into my um, cost that I want to minimize. Yes. And then I have a function that I need to minimize, but on that only depends on the coefficients C or this matrix C. Cool. Yes. Uh huh. And then, and then the next nice thing is that um, that has a fit, a closed form differential gradient, so I can minimize it with gradient mm -hmm. descent. Yes, that's handy to have an analytical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh huh. And and here in algorithm one, I I just write what the gradient update steps mm -hmm. are. Gotcha. Cool. I'm with you. Okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. So let's scroll down and get to implementing this. Okay. Yes. And perhaps we could scroll to uh, the next figure, actually, the okay. figure three. Uh huh. Bandwidth lag. Yeah. Looks good. Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah, so applying these techniques in practice, you still need a lot of data processing, data conditioning, removing outliers. Mm. Um, and essentially, um, that's some of what's described in this section. Um, one of the things to note is that um, if, when you remove a linear, the linear component of a collection of light curves, mm -hmm. as is shown from the top to the bottom figure here, Yes. Uh, you're able to effectively kind of separate out some of these systematics and make them easier to um, infer. So that's yeah. one of the one of the steps. Um, and then if you scroll down a little bit to the uh, next figure. Yeah, figure four, and here we are in the positions of our pixels. Okay. Yeah, so we want to apply this method um, where we have these gradient update steps to infer systematics. Um, and what I show here is um, each of these squares represents um, a Kepler module. Yes. Um, and so what I've described here is how I've selected my sample of light curves that I'm going to implement and run my algorithm on. So in light blue, I um, are the light curves which I I retain and I include, okay. um, and it's approximately uh, I, I believe maybe fifteen hundred light curves that I use as my test case. Okay. Um, and the uh, yeah the 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 gray um pixels represent things that I just didn't even bother to include. And then there are these dashed lines because yeah. I discretize the sensor into a 2D grid okay. in order to uh, apply my method. Uh, one of the kind of implicit um, simplifying assumptions is that the data is laid out on an, a 2D X and Y grid. Yes. And so um, I need, what I do is I, I approximately map my set of included light curves to their nearest Got it. spatial cell, what I call a cell. Got it. Okay. Now, right. this doesn't have to be the case, but it just made implementation a bit easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And addressing this is like another thing to add on in the future. Yes. Got it. So in, let me make sure I understand it. So in essence, the included ones are moved to nearest neighbor and become red. Um, some, uh, close, but um, so the red, Pick, uh, red points are excluded data. Um, I just, what I did is I gridded all of this, uh, these red and blue points, uh -huh. and then I picked the blue point, um, which was nearest to the center of each of these cells um, denoted okay. by the gridded points. And then if there was like no blue um, light curve in the cell, I picked the nearest red 
point and then so on. And then what I end up with is okay. the collection of blue points and the red points ignored. Got it. I'm with you. Thank you for that. I got it. Mm -hmm. So if we scroll down. Okay. Four, there's positions and correlations. So as an exploratory part of this paper, I looked at how strong are these correlations? Do they actually exist, these spatial yeah. correlations? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's important to know that I'm using a fixed uh, magnitude band of uh, Kepler magnitude 12 to 13. Okay. So I've already kind of isolated that magnitude in de uh, dependence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Though one of the nice things would be in the future to kind of try this same method, but adding in a prior for this dependence in magnitude of a similar form. Yes. Um, one okay, step so, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. One step at a time. <laughs> yeah, one step at a time. Um, so what I'm showing here is I'm showing three different quarters of Kepler data. That's mm -hmm. Q6, Q10, Q14. Yes. And I'm showing the Kepler sensor. E each of these uh, points in the top left corner is the module number. Mm -hmm. And what I've computed for each of these different modules is in black, the average pairwise correlation between all light curves in the module. Okay. And then in red, the difference between that value and the neighboring pairwise correlation of all okay. light curves in the module. Okay. So what I'm saying is that if the red number is uh, positive, that means that the spatial correlation constraint, sorry, spatial correlation is, a, is stronger than just a within module correlation between yes. all pairs of light curves. Okay. Okay. And as you can see, that's not always the case. Not um, always. I've got a few, few negatives. Yeah. So the, the, the algorithm needs a way yeah. to be able to infer that and yeah. um, not use that, not not impose a spatial correlation constraint if that there that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Um uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Yes. So, so what we have is we have the weighting matrix, um, which is this term I glossed over, which is uh, DW huh? in the spatial correlation constraint. And what this does is it weights uh, pairwise differences of uh, coefficient vectors. And um, it's kind of like another a hyper parameter or a hyper prior because mm -hmm. when we, we do some like uh, analysis to fit that um, weighting matrix. And then if, if think we think, our, and then we impose that into the actual model to allow for there to be discontinuities or um, regions which are less strongly correlated in the sensor. DW in case anyone's looking. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think that says a lot about that. Um, yeah, and there are different, uh, th there is some literature about why these spatial correlations may exist um, and the forms of sy systematics which may give rise to them. There's a paper by Marino et al, mm -hmm. um, which does a really thorough analysis of uh, the form of systematics in uh, Kepler data. And they describe how time-dependent systematics lag with radius, and this may give rise to spatial correlations. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. That's nice. Okay. So, yeah, so one of the really difficult things is to validate methods to infer systematics. Because a priori, we don't have any ground truth for the form of these systematics yes. in light curve data. It's really hard to have any kind of simple generative model for them. Okay. And we don't know what astrophysics are really truly present in light curve data either. Um, while we can detect transits if they're present, there may be stellar flaring effects, stellar variability, right. and there's, there's no ground truth database which says this is what the astrophysical signals look like and this is what the um, schematics look like. Yeah. Okay. So to, to evaluate um, this method was really a very tricky design process. Um, 
I came up with two experiments, which I think uh, can kind of address both of these questions okay. um, through different angles. The first being um, an experiment where I take real Kepler light curves okay. with realistic systematics, therefore, and I simulate astrophysical signals and I inject them into light curves. Yes. And I look at the recovery of those astrophysical signals in the light curves. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this can't tell me about the recovery of the systematics because I don't really know what their true form is. Um, but the, it can tell me about the recovery of the astrophysical signals that I added into the light curve. Yes. Um, okay. The second experiment, um, I simulate it systematics. Uh -huh. and astrophysical signals. And I look at the recovery of both the systematics and the astrophysical signals. Okay. There, I, I have ground truth for the systematics, so I can tell how well I've inferred it, but yes. I can't, uh, it's not realistic um, because yeah, I don't have a, a true generative model for systematics. Yes, understood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we scroll down a little bit, mm -hmm. Ooh, this is. just, this, this section describes, oh yeah, so here's another figure which may be um, interesting. So we need a way to initialize the algorithm. Sure. Um, and the here I'm showing a PCA decomposition uh -huh. of a collection of light curves uh, for three different observational quarters, quarter six, quarter 10, and quarter 14. Mm -hmm. And what I'm showing is the leading basis vector and the leading coefficient weighting. Got On it. the top is the coefficient vector for each of these three quarters, which is remarkably similar between the three of them. Yes. Mm. And then on the bottom is the coefficient uh, mapped to spatial position over yeah. the sensor. Uh -huh. And you can see there's this very blocky structure due to module sensitivity is being very similar, highly correlated, but there are these discontinuities of the edges of modules. Yes. Um, yeah. So in this section, I kind of talk a little bit more about how to initialize the method and the weight, choosing the weighting matrix and so on. Okay. Um, but sorry, we can skip down and go to the experiments and get into the results. Seven. So various. these are three of the forms of astrophysical signal that I simulate, um, mm. sine wave, transit and flare. These aren't physical simulations, right. they're just um, functional simulations. Correct, I understand. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. Seven, there's your experiments. Experiment A, injected transients. Oops. Yeah, so what I'm comparing against is principal component analysis uh -huh. in these experiments also, I should mention. Right. Um, now, as I said, in, in real methods like the Kepler PDC map method, there are these many stages of fine tuning and refining uh, estimates. It's not as if they just apply SVD once and call it a day. Right. Um, but I'm just comparing against that part of the method uh, or just the, the actual use of PCA and seeing can I better foundationally constrain these models themselves um, to try to reduce the overfitting of these unknown signal components okay. in the data. Good. Um, and so here is the simulated system, how I simulate the systematics for experiment B, mm -hmm. um, which is the experiment where I simulate both systematics and astrophysical signals. Yes. Um, we don't have to go into a great deal of detail, but I just try to simulate on the bottom some kind of blocky structure yes yes okay and mm -hmm. then for the basis vectors on the top i just i use a a, a subset of uh co-trending basis vectors which are the kepler um vectors obtained by applying svd yes. okay so i i multiply these these coefficients by these basis vectors to obtain systematic noise terms for individual light curves and then i add in noise okay. uh, gaussian noise Mm -hmm. So why I say that's not realistic is, in principle, there are more varied and diverse systematic effects than just those. Yes. But okay, so, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so should we uh, scroll down and sure. can talk about some of the actual B. results? Can we get into some of the results? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah so I trawled through the literature to find relevant metrics. Um, as I said, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do this kind of, to make a clear statement about performance without ground truth. Right. Um, some of the conventional detrending metrics are the uh, CDPP, a measure of scatter of the detrended light curve on transit time time scales. Okay. Okay. So this um, approximately computes the standard deviation of data binned to like six hour intervals. Okay. And um, yeah, this is a really important metric and a very useful one, but it's mm -hmm. primarily for the case of showing that um, transit signals are not going to be uh, affected by or the detrending does not um, downgrade the performance of transit detection. Right. However, with this paper, I wanted to take a more general approach. I wanted to maintain any kind of astrophysical variability, not just transit signals. Okay. Transit right. signals have very short time scales, but other astrophysical signals of interest may have very slow varying mm -hmm. long time scales. And mm -hmm. I wanted to retain that kind of variability too. Cool. So CDPP may not be the best measure of that. Right. Um, a second measure used by Stump et al is the um, goodness metric. And this computes the pairwise correlation cubed of detrended matrices. So essentially, instead of computing the pairwise, the average pairwise correlation, by cubing the detrended, uh, by cubing these pairwise correlations, you overweight terms where there is very strong high yeah. levels of correlation um, allows you to kind of see, uh, am I retaining large amounts of systematic variability? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I um, use some metrics based on correlation that I came up with myself. Um, the first is just the correlation of a detrended, like the average correlation of detrended light curves okay. with which were injected with an astrophysical signal with the astrophysical signal that I injected. So yeah. the idea there being that I want there to be a really high level of correlation because I don't want my systematics method to have overfit and remove this astrophysical signal that I'm interested in. Right. Okay, cool. I'm um, following, yes. But I also have to be careful because I don't want to accidentally, I don't want to just achieve better performance by not detrending the light curves or by somehow corrupting other light curves. So I also compute the correlation of light curves, which were not injected with signals with the injected the signals. Ones were. Okay. okay. Yeah, to try and see, um, have I um, corrupted Long those light way. curves? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I'm with you, yes. Okay. Um, and there are some other variations on these kinds of correlation metrics, but that kind of describes the bulk. So if we, uh, I guess if we scroll down and we go to the results section, and then we can come back to the figure, um, but it, okay. it makes sense to talk about it in order. Um, so is this well, the results or have I? I, I think we're, I think we, we're in the results section, right? Oh, okay. Uh, so it's a matter of which figure you want to show next. Oh yeah, results, okay, yeah. So if yeah. we go to, um, let's go with experiment A first, the okay. real light curves. Yes, this is. Okay, so. Yes. Yeah, we could talk about figure nine. So what I've plotted here, so first of all, for my experiments, I ran 10 iterations of these experiments um, I had 1,500 light curves arranged, gridded on the, the center, uh -huh. and I inject nine randomly simulated with random parameter signals into a variety of light curves. Okay. Nine you. may sound like a small amount, but I didn't want to um, unrealistically inject uh, a bulk amount of um, variability into light curves when they already had some kind of astrophysical variability. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I have this... And, and then I did that uh, 10 times. So I repeated that experiment 10 times. Okay. Um, so what I'm showing here is um, for each of the different signal types, I've just selected four of the different 
um, runs. four runs, four different um, of, of those signals, um, or sorry, averaged over those signals, but for four different runs. And I am showing uh, in each column a different kind of signal. So it's sign, transit, flare. Yes. And I show how the correlation changes over the iterations um, between the uh, astrophysical signal and the detrended light curve. Okay. Yes. So okay. when blue is higher than red, it means that my method has more ha faithfully recovered the astrophysical signal and not overfit that astrophysical signal. Okay. Okay. So what what we see is that it um, first of all okay. the sign signals seem to be really faithfully recovered. Very nice. Very nice. Uh huh. Um, and we see that the flare signals uh, tend to be tend to have improved performance, but not always. Uh, not so always. in this yeah. mm -hmm. in run one, it was worse. Yes. And then the transit signals are um, very close, but our method is always a bit lower. A bit lower. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the performance is worse. Um, because of the fact that SVD or PCA minimizes the least squares residual between uh, the light curves and the basis decomposition, yes. it means that that attains the maximally flat solution for a light, for a detrended light curve. So the solution which is closest to zero. Okay. And so that means that um, any method which preserves any amount of astrophysical variability, which is slightly more than that, will lower this correlation statistic for the transit signal just by the fact that there's other stuff present mm -hmm. in the light curve besides the transit signal. Okay. okay. Um, so if we scroll down to the next yeah. figure. Yeah, okay, that was for experiment A. Yeah. Still on experiment. Here I show the, the actual decomposition that's obtained. Mm -hmm. So for the spatial method, um, that's shown in blue, mm -hmm. and then the PCA method shown in red. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not much else, so much you can say about this other than the fact that um, perhaps these like highly oscillatory later basis terms. Mm -hmm. So each of these represents a basis vector, and then these are like the less significant ones as you go gotcha. higher yeah. in number. Yes. Um, yes. Perhaps these. Uh, PCA terms were the ones responsible for overfitting and removing sign mm -hmm. <laughs> signals injected into the light curves. Mm -hmm. And then our method kind of obtained different solutions. I should say we initialize our method with the PCA, PCA. Uh, solution. Okay. 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 And then below, if you scroll down, mm -hmm. so we're looking now at the coefficients, um, i.e. the amplitude of these systematic effects by for uh, the top five basis terms, okay. shown one through five, for uh -huh. PCA on the top and for the spatial method on the bottom. Yes, I'm with you. Yes. And, and what you can see is it obtains kind of a smoother, spatially smooth solution. Yes. But it yes. also allows for like discontinuities where there's really a light curve that says, oh no, we we have a completely different value for this particular basis term. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Cool. Doing a good job there. Okay. Yeah. So we can scroll down now. I'm, I'm gaining confidence in this. <laughs> <laughs> and 12. There we go. Yeah. So here I show the results for some uh, light curves um, which have been detrended. And you can see that the flare signals tend to be very faithfully recovered um, by our algorithm shown on the bottom. Um, and the sign signals seem to be more faithfully recovered as well. Um, the transit signals, not a huge difference between them, um, nice. as you can see. Okay, transit. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, so um, we talked a lot about. Um, the method and I think like experiment A kind of summarizes the main takeaway results of the paper. Okay. That being that these slower varying signals tend to be less overfit by our method yes. as compared to PCA. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, we can, we can go quickly and I'll show you a couple more figures Sounds that good. emphasize this point um, 
if you scroll down um a little bit okay we got the experiment a little bit more experiment day results we got that yes yeah, these are the averaged over signal type but yes scroll a little bit more down sorry it's all good it's all good 13 experiment b um a little bit further uh -huh. and a little bit further <laughs> Because it's a long paper, people. It's a good one. <laughs> long, long form exposition. Okay. And this is for experiment B. Uh, yeah, experiment B with the simulator data. And then if we go down a little bit more, just the, the figure that I want to show is um almost there. I can feel it. 16. Uh, next one, sorry. Goodness of fit. Grid this itself. one. Here we are. Okay. <laughs> All right. I see why you wanted this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think this one really clearly makes the point. Um so in the first uh, figure on the left, I show the strength of the injected astrophysical signal. Yes. Um, and this is for the simulated uh, systematics experiment B. Uh-huh, yes. Um, in the middle, I show the PCA coefficient weights yes. for um, the fifth coefficient. Um, now, in this experiment, I, I did something different to, well... I don't know if it's different to experiment A, but I, I picked a larger uh, model rank for my systematics okay. than the uh, simulated systematics. Okay. The idea being I wanted to really simulate the effect of overfitting yes. in this data. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. So so this, um, what we're seeing here is the coefficient corresponding to the K plus one basis vector, i.e. Um, higher model order than what exists in the real data. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the middle figure shows the PCA solution. And what you can see is that this should be zero everywhere because um, there is only four, the, the model rank is only four that I used to simulate the data. Mm -hmm. However, um, what you see is that um, it's not non zero. You have right. where the astrophysical signals were injected, um, weights, coefficient amplitudes, which are larger than zero. And then if you compare to the spatial method, yes. um, still not zero, but largely reduced from reduced. the PCA solution. Correct. Which no, means good. these cells um, were where an astrophysical signal was injected, and our method has reduced the overfitting of these cells as compared to PCA. Beautiful. Okay. Yes. Very nice. Okay. Yeah, and I also... Um, forgot to mention that I did a comparison to other existing detrending methods as implemented in the light curve library. Mm -hmm. And that's shown in experiment C. Yes. Um, and what we show is there's a lot of variation. Um, some of the other methods do much better in reducing the um, goodness metric and CDPP. Um, I believe that they all kind of perform comparably on the CDPP okay. metric, but that was that figure 16 above. Um... 16. Oh, this one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty one. Okay. Yeah, so our method is in blue, pixel yeah. level detrending in yellow, yeah. um, self flat fielding in red. Yes. And then the goodness metric is shown on the x axis and the CDPP, that measure of uh, scatter on transit time scales is shown on the right. Cool. Okay. Uh -huh. um, Just lays it out. So, cool. yeah, I think um, it's really difficult to compare these methods because a lot of them require fine tuning. And I can't personally optimize every method for the data. Yeah. Uh, I use some of the kind of default implementations. It doesn't mean that's the best possible performance you could attain. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's nice. So I think that kind of sums up the main takeaways of the paper. Um, there's a long appendix as well with all the details. Um, but the main result is that our method seems to reduce the level of overfitting for these very, very slow varying uh, signals. The reason being is not because um, transit signals are never overfit, but there's just a lower likelihood that they're overfit because they have this very short duration. They tend to yes. be less incidentally correlated with systematics. Cool. Nice. Nice. And I am going to do a shout out on the appendices. 
and mainly because a they're really nice uh but they also have this really lovely table for where you actually define all your symbols uh this is really lovely please do this if you're doing this kind of work <laughs> very cool Jamila, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very awesome article. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Frank, for having me. It was great. Sure. And you touched on it a little bit there as we were we were going through. And so um, I'll just push on it a little bit. Um, uh, where do you think we go from here, given the published article? Uh, are there additional... Um, uh, detrendings to try, some of the assumptions that went into the spatial one, can those be relaxed? Can this be applied to other telescopes or things where we have enormous amounts of data coming down, like LSST or Roman or something of that order? So, so where do we go from here? Yeah, so I think, um, as you mentioned, the it's really important to have these automated methods, especially for these telescopes with a huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly similar methods can be applied in any of these other contexts. Um, the fine tuning comes from what are the physical characteristics that we expect for systematics in these different instruments. Right. And yeah. that may be empirically inferred, right. or there may be some kind of prior mm -hmm. physical model. Right. Um, but I, yeah, the way I would like to modify it, uh, my work here is to add on more of these terms and to be able to um, add them on and inf kind of infer them in a semi-automated fashion. Nice. As I mentioned, um, a correlation constraint for magnitude dependence Correct. for similar magnitude targets, mm -hmm. uh, higher level spatial <clears throat> correlations, maybe for disparate sources on the sensor. Nice. Um, those are some of the directions that I think this work could be developed in. Nice. Very cool. <clears throat> Very cool. Well, I really look forward to... Um, uh, you graduating and be some of these methods um, being put in. That'd be really great. I look forward to it. Very nice. Thank you. And that will do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.